Distinguished guests, members of vessels, ladies and gentlemen, as this is our 30th annual meeting, I thought it an ideal occasion to celebrate the contributions of our founders and charter members in establishing the International Society for the Study of the Lumbar Spine. In this address, I intend to give an account of the forces leading to the formation of vessels in 1974 and to assess the impact of this on lumbar spine research. As the first meeting I attended was not until 1981, I have relied on others for information on the formative years. However, when putting events into perspective, it may well have been an advantage to look back without too much ownership of the past. I wish to acknowledge Bernie Finnison's 19 84 presidential address which contained an account of the formation of vessels. I am most grateful to Walt Simmons for the use of his recorded interviews with key charter members and also to Lee Wilsey, Michael Sullivan and Ron Beetham who shed new light by providing me with important documents and details of their involvement. Finally I wish to thank the many other charter members and their wives who responded to my requests for information. From the information collated, it became clear that the catalyst for the formation of vessels was the coming together at meetings of surgeons from different parts of the world in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Whereas North American surgeons established the Scoliosis Research Society founded in 1966 as the Scoliosis Club and the Cervical Spine Research Society founded in 1973, the formation of ISSLs was both international and multidisciplinary from the very beginning. In fact, the roots of our society can be traced to several individuals attending key meetings in Hong Kong, Australia, the United Kingdom and North America. In 1968, following the second Western Pacific Orthopaedic Association meeting in Hong Kong, J.P. O'Brien organised a spinal symposium attended by approximately 75 registrants. The international faculty included Lee Wilsey, who later became the first president of ISSELS, and Ed Simmons. During the preceding week in Hong Kong, Ron Beetham from Ballarat and Arthur Yao had assisted Alan Dwyer from Sydney with a demonstration of his novel technique of screw and cable fixation for the anterior correction of thoracolumbar scoliosis. These are the pre and post operative radiographs of that particular patient. During the symposium on the sixth post-operative day, this patient walked unassisted in front of the assembled audience. This created an extraordinary impression, as it was not unusual at that time for a patient to be kept in bed for several months following scoliosis surgery. Dwyer had received very little encouragement from his Sydney colleagues. However, he gained considerable support from Arthur Hodson, then Professor of Orthopaedics in Hong Kong and an undisputed pioneer of anterior spinal surgery. Perhaps Hodson was thinking of Dwyer's predicament when he wrote an editorial for the Journal of the Western Pacific Orthopaedic Association in 1968. In the editorial that preceded the papers presented at the Hong Kong Spinal Symposium, Hodgson stated, anterior spinal surgery is a subject of controversy. Most of the resistance to this approach to the spine comes from the individual who has not used it or who knows little about it and rejects it either because he's too old or too lazy to learn about it. At the conclusion of the Hong Kong meeting, there was discussion about having a further spinal symposium in conjunction with the combined meeting of the orthopaedic associations of the English-speaking world, 
due to be held in Sydney in 1970. The 1970 Spinal Symposium was held in Ballarat, Australia, chaired by Ron Beetham. Harry Farfan from Montreal, who later became the founding chairman of ISSELS, was one of the 35 registrants. The program included a prominent international surgical faculty. From the USA, there were L. L. Wiltsey and P. H. Harmon, who was, not who was absent for the photo. Canada was represented by E. H. Simmons and W. H. Farney. South Africa by G. F. Domacy and T. B. Enslin. Japan by N. Nakano. Hong Kong by J. P. O'Brien and Australia by A.F. Dwyer and H.V. Croc, also absent for the photograph. The attending Australians decided to form a society named the Facet Club, which first met in 1971 with Dwyer as the founding chairman, changing its name to the Spine Society of Australia in 1989. According to Beetham, at the Ballarat gathering, there was discussion about the formation of an international society concerned with the lumbar spine, and he claims this was the point of conception of ISSELS. Certainly, the fact that a disproportionate number of charter members were Australian, 10 out of a total of 70, is a measure of the influence of the Ballarat meeting on the subsequent formation of ISSELS. At the end of the Ballarat meeting, it was decided to hold a further international spinal meeting in 1972. Ed Simmons suggested the meeting be held on the island of Kos, the birthplace of Hippocrates, and Beetham was empowered to make the necessary arrangements. In addition to those present at Ballarat, Beetham invited other prominent international surgeons with an interest in the lumbar spine and more than 20 people were booked to attend the meeting in June 1972, but at the 11th hour, the arrangements were cancelled due to the May 30th massacre by terrorists at Tel Aviv's Lod, Air Lod Airport, which left 25 dead and 72 wounded. The last occasion I spoke with Harry Farfam was at the 93 Marseille meeting the year before his death. I asked him for his version of how ISSELS began. Farfan disagreed with Beetham's view that the concept of ISSELS had originated in Ballarat. Farfan said that when Beetham let the arrangements for a further meeting lapse, he and Alan Dwyer from Sydney formed a committee of two with the aim of establishing an international society um, for the study of the lumbar spine. It was a brainwave uh, of two people, both of them with several scratches. One was a gentleman, a good friend of mine, Alan Dwyer, from Australia, and myself. We went to several meetings together. Dwyer had first met Farfan at the 1970 combined meeting in Sydney, where according to his wife, Arelli, Farfan presented the first paper, his first major paper on his research. Dwyer, who was immediately impressed with what he heard, arranged to visit Farfan in Montreal. Both Dwyer and Farfan were Catholic with large families, 16 offspring between them, were heavy smokers and enjoyed their drink. With so much in common, it was not surprising that they developed a close friendship. According to Farfan, the committee of two decided that Farfan, a few years the senior, should be the chairman. Rather, uh, uh, Dwyer would be the chairman and Farfan would be the secretary. They met twice in 1972 at Farfan's home in Montreal. Farfan recalled that during the first of these meetings, he said to Dwyer, I said to Alan, I said, I bet there must be 15 people in this whole world who go anywhere to talk about spines. He says, you know what, I think I agree with you. I, for one, will go, and I know you will go. So I said, well, all right, what do we do about it? What they did about it was to draw up a list of potential members 
and the following year invitations were issued to a small group, about 15 people, to meet near Farfan's home in Montreal. In May and June of 1972, Michael Sullivan visited several centres in North America on a travelling fellowship from the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in London, where he was about to commence work as a consultant. His first port of call was Montreal to visit Farfan, followed by Toronto, where he spent time with Ian McNabb. Next, he visited Lee Wiltsey, followed by Henry LaRocca, shown here, William Fielding and Richard Rothman. At this time, Sullivan was unaware Farfan was contemplating the formation of a lumbar spine society. However, during his stay in Toronto, McNabb told him he thought at time a low back society was formed. LaRocca had just completed a fellowship with McNabb who suggested that LaRocca and Sullivan should get together to organise a low back society and a spine journal. McNabb offered to head the society along with Philip Newman from London and Lee Wiltsey, the same triumvirate who came together in 1976 to publish their seminal paper on the classification of spondylolisthesis. In October 1972, LaRocca attended a London meeting on low back pain at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital, Stanmore. The concept of establishing an international lumbar spine society was further discussed with Newman and with Sullivan. Preliminary plans were drawn up including a list of potential contributors and the creation of letterhead entitled the Low Back Society. Sullivan was given the task of developing the Low Back Society, La Rocca the task of establishing a spine journal which culminated in LaRocca's appointment as editor-in-chief of Spine uh, when it was first published in 1976. During the 1960s and 70s, the American Academy of Orthopaedic Surgeons ran a number of continuing medical education programs on the spine. The faculty usually included speakers from different disciplines, including anatomists, biomedical engineers, and physicians from various specialties. One such meeting, chaired by Richard Rothman, shown here, was held at the Marriott Hotel in Philadelphia in November 1973. At the conclusion of this meeting, a conversation took place between Mark Brown, LaRocca, Alf Narkomson, Rothman and Wiltsey, all of whom wished to be involved in the establishment of a low back society. At the same time, Farfam was in the process of establishing a meeting of 15 people in Montreal. Wiltsey, invited to participate, advised Farfan to enlarge his meeting by including Sullivan's Low Back Society group. Similarly, McNabb, on hearing of the Farfan meeting, contacted Sullivan, suggesting an amalgamation of both groups. Carried by the enthusiasm for Low Back Society, in January 74, a meeting was arranged by Wilsey during the annual meeting of the American Academy of Orthopaedic Surgeons held in Dallas, Texas. Chaired by Wilsey, an interim executive committee was formed consisting of Wilsey as interim president, Fielding interim vice president and LaRocca as interim secretary. To encourage and support international representation, regional chairmen were appointed, Richard Rothman, Eastern United States, York Galante, Central USA, Home of Pheasant, Western USA, Marvin Tile, Canada, Alf Narkomson, Europe, Michael Sullivan, Great Britain and Africa, and Harry Crock, Western Pacific. It was decided that the first meeting would be held in Montreal with Farfan as chairman. Due to increasing interest in the society, Farfan made a reservation of the Longueuil Hotel, uh, the Holiday Inn, for an estimated 70 participants well short of the 135 that finally attended. Over the next few months, Harry Farfan and Lee Wiltsey communicated regularly to organise the Montreal meeting. A variety of possible names for the society were considered before settling on Farfan's and probably Dwyer's preferred title, the International Society for the Study of the Lumbar Spine. The proposed title was subsequently endorsed 
at the first executive meeting and later ratified at the general session. Three specific guidelines were embraced when formulating the type of society to be established. The first was that members should be involved in some research aspect of the lumbar spine rather than being totally consumed with clinical work. Secondly, individuals from the basic sciences, engineering and various medical specialties should be encouraged to participate in the society as active members with full rights. There would be no associate members or second class citizens. Thirdly, it was considered important that members demonstrate an ongoing and continued special interest in the lumbar spine. These principles were subsequently included in the bylaws drawn up in 1974 under the chairmanship of Homer Pheasant, encapsulating the spirit of our society. By all accounts, the inaugural meeting of 135 registrants held from the 19th to 22nd of June 1974 was a great success. So at the meeting in Montreal, we had a, a great turnout. I picked, because I was lazy, I picked the nearest hotel to my own house. And I could walk to the hotel. And it was very small. And the situation was, uh, as far as an international meeting, was a little primitive. But everybody seemed to have a good time. Certainly the scientific program included papers from a number of world authorities on the lumbar spine. George Domasey from South Africa presented his research on the circulation of the spinal cord involving seven years of painstaking study. It was Domasey's devastating experience of paraplegia complicating instrumented correction of scoliosis in a young girl that was the stimulus for his seminal research. Philip Newman from England discussed his work on degenerative spondylolisthesis and Henk Verbeest of the Netherlands, considered the father of spinal stenosis, presented his study on this subject. Alf Narkinson presented the results of his group's dispressure studies, and Lee Wilsey discussed the value of preoperative psychological screening. There was one particularly sad note to the meeting. The program included an abstract from Alan Dwyer, who was unable to attend when his health deteriorated. He required an esophagectomy <clears throat> for advanced carcinoma, the procedure being carried out one month before the Montreal meeting. Dr. N. Newton, a longtime friend of Dwyer and a surgeon of exceptional skill, performed the operation. In fact, Newton had taught Dwyer the thoracoabdominal approach he employed for scoliosis correction. Dwyer's personal tragedy was heightened when his friend and colleague collapsed a few days after performing the surgery and died from cerebral metastatic disease just six weeks later. This information was contained in a letter from Dwyer to Arelli and Harry Farfan dated the 9th of July 1974, just three weeks after the inaugural meeting, in which it's, he stated, I have had news from several sources to tell me that the meeting was a great success and I very much regretted missing it. I was looking forward to it so much actually that I did consider at one time ignoring my symptoms until after the trip. However, that probably would not have been a good idea. Acknowledged by Farfan as the co-founder of Issels, Dwyer was a man of remarkable foresight and ingenuity. His screw and cable system, developed in 1963, was one of the first forms of segmental fixation of the spine, the other being pedicle screw fixation developed by Roy Camille in the same year. In 1972, Dwyer was the first to introduce direct current as an adjunct to anterior and posterior fusions of the spine. His paper on this topic was not presented at the Montreal meeting, but together with the majority of papers, it was published in 1975 in orthopaedic clinics of North America. Of the 35 papers presented, nine were concerned with spinal mechanics, 
six were on basic science, less than one third of the papers were related to surgical treatment. The presenters came from eight countries, Australia, Canada, Great Britain, Holland, New Zealand, South Africa, Sweden, and the United States. An international and multidisciplinary society for the study of the lumbar spine had been well and truly launched. Many years later, when reflecting on the importance of the formation of Issels to basic science, Farfan stated, until 1972, the number of centres working on basic research related to the lumbar spine numbered three in Great Britain, three in Canada, eight in the United States, one in Scandinavia, and three in Australia. With the formation of the International Society for the Study of the Lumbar Spine in 1973, the interest in basic science was given a tremendous boost. Throughout his career, Farfan, in his own inimitable style, boosted interest in basic science and biomechanics. He was renowned for his use of simple line drawings and other visual aids to explain his concept of stability. At the inaugural business meeting of the society, Wiltsey was inducted as the president for 1974, Sullivan was appointed secretary, and the office for the society for the next four years was the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in London. During this period, Sullivan's secretary acted as the administrative secretary for the society. Homer Pheasant designed the society logo, symbolizing internationalism, and this formed part of the distinctive letterhead used since 1976. Sullivan singled out special praise for Henk Verbeest, president in 1976, for his wonderful efforts in promoting the fledgling Issels in Europe. In 1978, Marvin Tile assumed the role of secretary. The database of members was transferred to Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto, which became the permanent secretariat for the society. Shirley Fitzgerald was appointed as the administrative secretary, a position she has held with distinction and dedication for the past 25 years. Meeting sites alternated between North America and Europe until 1985 when the meeting was held in Sydney, Australia. The 30 annual scientific meetings have been held in 15 countries. The only site to be revisited was Montreal 10 years after the inaugural meeting and once again Farfan was the organising chairman. Whereas the charter members came from 10 countries and four disciplines, today's membership includes 31 countries and 16 disciplines. Our 29 presidents have been selected from 10 countries, Australia, Canada, England, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Sweden. In clinical papers with basic science or biomechanical papers, there was no significant difference in regards to the proportion of descriptive papers. However, over the past decade, there has been a linear increase in the proportion of randomized controlled trials amongst clinical papers when compared with basic science or biomechanical papers. It is apparent from this assessment that the overall quality of research presented to the society has steadily improved over the past 25 years. The changing scene of spinal research is illustrated by the most popular topics discussed at meetings during this period. In 1978, these were scar following laminectomy and biomechanical testing of bone. In 1982, the treatment of prolapse disc and chemonucleolysis. In 1987, psychosocial factors in back pain. In 1992, biomechanics of the degenerative disc. In 1997, physiological mechanisms of sciatica. And in 2002, bone morphogenic proteins. 54% of abstracts presented at the 1998 to 2000 meetings went on to publication, compared with 45% for the years 91 to 93. 
the factors related to publication included basic science or biomechanics, use of blinded or independent observers, an experimental design, and a significant positive result. In addition to the presentation of papers at annual scientific meetings and the subsequent publication of research, the Society has promoted research on lumbar spine disorders and their management through two important initiatives. Firstly, Jim Weinstein and Sam Wiesel served as editors of The Lumbar Spine, a publication authored by members of the Society and first printed in 1990. The second edition in two volumes was published in 1996 with an expanded editorial committee. It contains contributions from 116 of the Society's members representing most of the membership countries and disciplines. Led by Harry Herkovitz, the editorial committee is in the process of finalising the third edition of this much acclaimed textbook. The second educational initiative was the establishment of instructional courses introduced by Gunnar Anderson during his term as president in 1989. The courses often held in developing countries have been most successful. A total of 15 courses by members of the society have been conducted in 12 countries under the chairmanship of Gunnar Anderson and Yuzhi Dvorak. Throughout the years, the Society has made available various fellowships and awards aimed at encouraging lumbar spine research in both established institutions and developing countries. However, it was the Volvo Awards, arguably the premier international spinal research award, which became synonymous with ISSLs. First established in 1979 as an initiative of Alf Narkomsen, the presentation of the Volvo Awards has been one of the highlights of annual scientific meetings for the past 24 years. Unquestionably, the Volvo Award competition, run by a committee chaired by Narkomsen, has been a major catalyst for lumbar spine research internationally, both within and outside of the society. With the closure of the Volvo Award comes the birth of the Issels Prize, to be presented for the first time tomorrow. The name symbolising the confidence, maturity and international standing of the society. I now wish to turn my attention to the relationship between two icons of our society. In 1977, whilst working as a clinical fellow in Toronto, I was encouraged by Ian McNabb to visit Harry Farfan in Montreal. During my stay, Farfan asked who had suggested I visit him and expressed surprise at my reply, stating I was the first person McNabb had sent. It was apparent that they did not always see eye to eye. Many years later, at the Marseille meeting, when I was discussing the formation of ISSLs with Farfan, he expressed the disappointment he had felt at McNabb not attending the inaugural meeting and resigning his membership three years later. It appeared that he had taken this as a personal front. However, I think it most likely that McNabb's lack of involvement this time was due, as we heard, uh, from my presidential guest speaker, to intense personal pressures, having been recently subjected to a devastating family tragedy. His widely read book entitled Backache, that was first published in 1977, was dedicated to Gillian, his beloved daughter who drowned in an accident in May 1973, the year preceding the inaugural meeting. It is apparent from Sullivan's account that McNabb was in fact extremely supportive of the formation of ISSLs. He had encouraged the intended Low Back Society group to join forces with Farfan's group. Moreover, he was instrumental in LaRocca's creation of the journal Spine. This team of McNabb and LaRocca, which ceased to exist when both passed away in 1992, is remembered by the attachment of their names to the ISSLs Travelling Fellowship. Furthermore, McNabb's overall contribution to the lumbar spine was recognised in 1979 when he was made an honorary member of the society, the only clinician or researcher 
in the history of vessels to be awarded this distinction. Following his death in 1994, Harry Farfan and his pivotal role as founding chairman are remembered warmly at each annual scientific meeting with the linking of his name to the presidential guest lecture. He is seen in this photo doing what he enjoyed so much, having a conversation with one of his longtime Issel's friends, Jean Cochois from Paris, their conversation no doubt being conducted in French. Ladies and gentlemen, the International Society for the Study of the Lumbar Spine was established in 1974 by a group of clinicians, scientists and engineers with a collective vision for the future to encourage lumbar spine research through international and interdisciplinary collaboration. The Society's record of achievement during the past 30 years is testament to the fact that our founders and charter members have left a wonderful legacy of which all of us should be very grateful. Finally, I wish to sincerely thank the members of ISSELS for granting me the great privilege of serving as president for the past year. To follow in the footsteps of my predecessors was the highest possible accolade of my professional career and something of which I'm unashamedly proud. Thank you very much. Thank you.